Jesus of Nazareth was speaking in Jerusalem to a crowd that was mostly hostile to him. It was actually jealousy that made the Jewish leadership hostile to Jesus. So they stirred up the crowd to object to his healing people on the Sabbath and to object to his calling God his own father, which meant that he was more than just another man. But instead of backing down from what he was doing and from the bold statements he was making, Jesus then made an even bolder claim. He said, all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. <clears throat> Can you imagine what that must have looked like? A man standing in front of you and making a claim like that, that all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Who could possibly claim the ability to do such a thing? Shortly before saying that, Jesus had stopped by the pool of Bethesda, where sick and infirm people gathered in the hope of being healed by the water. And there he had found a man who had been unable to walk for 38 years. And Jesus healed him, and the man could walk again. The account in John's Gospel says, One man there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized that he had spent a long time in this condition, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm going on my way, someone else goes in before me. Then Jesus told him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately the man was made well, and he picked up his mat and began to walk. You would think that everyone who saw what happened would have been rejoicing and praising God, but many of them ignored the miracle Jesus performed and instead complained that the man was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Now this happened on the Sabbath day. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath, it is unlawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. And that made the crowd furious, not just with the invalid who carried his mat, but also furious with Jesus for telling the man to pick up and carry his mat. So that was the mindset of the people Jesus was talking to. When he told them, all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, they didn't believe him. Of course, it would be hard to believe anyone who made such an outrageous claim as that, claiming the ability to call the dead to come out from their graves. But Jesus had just healed a man who had been unable to walk for 38 years. That miracle Jesus performed might have been enough to make an unbiased observer consider and ponder over Jesus' claim to be able to do something much, much more powerful, to call all the dead out of their graves. But for a crowd that was already hostile to Jesus, a crowd that was more concerned about the man carrying a mat than the man walking again after 38 years as an invalid, for such a hostile crowd as that, Jesus' words about raising the dead simply added fuel to the fire, the fire of their hatred toward him. So for them, more proof was needed. But would even that additional proof be enough to overcome their hostility? The answer came a couple of years later. Jesus provided more proof that he really had the power to fulfill his promise that all who were in the graves will hear his voice and come out. He provided that proof by standing in a cemetery, a graveyard, and causing a dead man who was buried there to hear his voice and come out of his grave. If Jesus could actually do that, causing that dead man in his grave to hear Jesus' voice and come out, it would serve as proof demonstrating his ability to carry out that promise that all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. 
John's Gospel tells us what happened on that occasion. At this time, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary, whose brother Lazarus was sick, was to anoint the Lord with perfume and wipe his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Bethany was a village in Judea, just outside Jerusalem, and Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were friends of Jesus. They knew where to find him because he had been staying for some time in the wilderness beyond the Jordan River, preaching to crowds who went out there to hear him. So Lazarus' sisters sent someone out there to tell Jesus that Lazarus was sick and dying and needed his help. Jesus' disciples were with him when he received the message that they sent to him. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The disciples who heard Jesus say this must have been puzzled as to what he meant. And what he meant, of course, was that Lazarus was going to die, but was going to come out of his grave when Jesus called him, and that this would glorify Jesus as the Son of God and would prove his ability to carry out that promise that all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Something very good was going to result from the terminal illness Lazarus was then suffering from. But the situation was complicated. If Jesus had dropped everything when he got the message and had rushed to Lazarus' aid, he could have healed him and prevented his death. And that's what everyone might have expected, because the account tells us, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Christ would have wanted to help them right away, but he had in mind doing an even greater good for them by demonstrating that he was the Son of God who had power to raise the dead. So on hearing that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two days. And then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. But the situation was complicated by more than just the need to hold off helping until after Lazarus had died. It was also complicated by the situation back in Judea where Lazarus and his sisters lived. The crowds in Judea that had been hostile toward Jesus two years earlier had recently become even more hostile. In fact, the last time he had preached to them in public, they had tried to kill him. The disciples who were with Jesus in the wilderness hoped he would not actually go there. Rabbi, they replied, the Jews just tried to stone you Are you going back there? They couldn't see any point in taking that risk, even if Lazarus was sick and dying. But Jesus explained that this was the right time to do what had to be done. It was sort of like the popular saying, make hay while the sun shines. Jesus put it like this. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? If anyone walks in the daytime, he will not stumble because he sees by the light of this world. But if anyone walks at night, he will stumble because he has no light. So even though danger awaited them in Judea from the hostile crowds they had encountered before, Jesus was determined to go there anyway. His time on earth was limited, and he had things to accomplish while it was still daytime, so to speak. After he had said this, he told them, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. The disciples still didn't get it. Jesus often taught them using parables or illustrations, and he often left things unclear for them at first to help them think and reason things through for themselves. His disciples replied, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get better. They thought that Jesus was talking about actual sleep, but he was speaking about the death of Lazarus. So Jesus told them plainly, 
Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. What Jesus had in mind still wasn't clear to the disciples. They couldn't imagine that Jesus was about to call a dead man to rise from the grave. But the danger of going back to Judea, where a crowd had tried to stone Jesus to death the last time they were there, that danger was very real to the disciples. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, so that we may die with him. The disciples showed their dedication to Jesus, that they were willing to face death with him if necessary. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already spent four days in the tomb. Let me read that again. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already spent four days in the tomb. This is an important point, not something just mentioned in passing. Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. He was not someone who may have appeared to die, but who was actually still alive, only misdiagnosed as being dead. Lazarus was really dead. He was dead and buried and had actually already been in the grave for four days. The home that Lazarus had shared with his sisters was now a house of mourning filled with visitors who had come to give their condolences. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, a little less than two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them in the loss of their brother. Since he was such a controversial figure in Judea, Jesus avoided the crowds at their home, but somehow he sent word to Lazarus' sisters so he could meet with them privately. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. After greeting Jesus, Martha said something truly amazing to him. Not only did she express faith that Jesus could have healed Lazarus, but she also hinted or implied that Jesus could even now raise Lazarus from the dead. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. If Jesus were to look up to heaven and ask God to raise Lazarus back to life, Martha seemed to imply, she was sure that God would answer that request. But Jesus didn't take the bait, at least not immediately. His reply was very simple. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Now that could have been taken two ways. It could have meant that Jesus was reminding her of the Old Testament's promise of a future resurrection of the dead. Or it could have meant that Jesus was about to perform a miracle. Martha was hoping for a miracle to bring her brother back to life right then. Martha replied, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She knew that the prophet Daniel had recorded the promise from God's angel that at the time of the end, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, but others to shame and everlasting contempt. But Martha was hoping that Jesus meant that he would bring Lazarus back to life that same day, and Christ did not disappoint her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. That satisfied Martha that Jesus was about to work the miracle that she hoped for. She didn't need to question him any further. After Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside to tell her, The teacher is here and is asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. 
Mary shared Martha's faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were in the house consoling Mary saw how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary too and Martha both had strong faith in Jesus. Mary too knew that Jesus could heal the sick. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they answered. Jesus wept. Even when we have faith in Christ and in the promise of the resurrection, it's still a painful thing to lose a loved one. Jesus knows that, and he actually shared Mary and Martha's pain. He cried real tears with them, even though he knew what he was about to do. Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them asked, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept Lazarus from dying? Those who came to comfort Mary and Martha must have included some from that crowd in Jerusalem that was so hostile toward Jesus. Some of the visitors appreciated Jesus' love, while others looked for things to criticize. Jesus, once again deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus said. Lord, by now he stinks, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. It has already been four days. This is an important point. Lazarus' body had already been in the grave for four days. The corpse was already starting to decompose, and so Martha gave that warning. That meant that Jesus was not about to raise someone who had just died, whose heart had just stopped, or who might not have been fully dead. It was not like reviving someone whose heart stopped on the operating table. It was not like giving CPR to someone who had just drowned in a swimming pool or someone who accidentally received an electric shock. Lazarus was really dead and his body had been decomposing in the grave for four days. But that did not stop Jesus from performing the miracle he intended to do. It just made it a much greater miracle. It added to the evidence that Jesus could say that someday all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. It won't matter if their bodies had decomposed, it won't matter if they were cremated. It won't matter if their body was lost at sea. It won't matter how they died or what happened to their body. All those in the graves will hear his voice and come out. All of the dead will hear his voice and come out. So Jesus responded with confidence to Martha's cautionary words about the state of decomposition of Lazarus' body. Jesus replied, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted his eyes upward and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, so they may believe that you sent me. After Jesus had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. That's what Jesus will do in the future, when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. He'll call, Charlie, come out. He'll call, Josephine, come out. He'll call, Terence, come out. He'll call, Julie, come out. Jesus will call all of the dead and they will come out of the grave. 
He proved that he will be able to do that by standing in front of that tomb and calling, Lazarus, come out. The man who had been dead came out with his hands and feet bound in strips of linen and his face wrapped in a cloth. Unwrap him and let him go, Jesus told them. Many people came to believe in Jesus on that day, and many others came from far and wide to see Lazarus after he went home and resumed his normal life after being called to rise from the grave. Now that you too have seen what Jesus did, you too are invited to put faith in him. Turn to Jesus in your own private prayers and confess that you're a sinner, that you need him as your savior. And tell Jesus in prayer that you want to follow him as your Lord, just as Lazarus, Mary, and Martha did, and just as the early disciples and true Christians down through the ages have all done. Jesus will accept your prayer of faith. The time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. The Apostle John, who recorded the events surrounding Lazarus, also wrote the Bible's last book, the book of Revelation where he recorded a vision God gave him. He saw the future in that vision and said, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and there were open books, and one of them was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. But if you put your faith in Jesus now, you can gain eternal life right now and never face that judgment. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death to life. Put your faith in Jesus now and you will not come under judgment. Rather, you will cross over from death to life. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. In addition to these live streamed services, Bible Nook provides Bibles and books that you can download for free in digital form at BibleNook.com. Our videos of the worship services and individual messages are available for streaming at YouTube.com slash Bible Nook and also at Facebook.com slash Bible Nook Ministry. These live stream services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And these services are also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages, with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails have reached millions of people. And Facebook and YouTube report hundreds of thousands of views by people who watch and listen. For example, more than 80,000 views were reported for our message on the signs leading up to Christ's return, and about 85,000 views for our message don't count on a second chance if you're left behind. Our other messages are reaching additional thousands each week. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. All the gifts we receive go directly to spreading the gospel message. If the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on this gospel outreach, 
You can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook, 214 Onset Avenue, Suite 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558.